the way we consume and share news today. It is larger rooted in social media outlets, a reason why it's crucial to look at what's being discussed online. From the hottest issues to trends for our daily social media minute, we're joined by Yerika. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Monday. Happy Monday to you too. All right, let's get started with some of these buzzwords. Uh, it's kind of a sad moment when we realize those who are dedicating their life, a life of sacrifice to protect the people, um, they don't get hearty meals. It makes us uh, turn our attention to, well, should we be treating them better? So the latest conversation starter apparently online is a firefighters' meager meal budget. Um, and if you look at the images of what's been served, it just doesn't look sufficient. No, it doesn't look sufficient at all. Uh, the average budget, it looks like, uh, for firefighters' meals is as low as 3,101, which is roughly $2.33. That's per meal. And that has raised a lot of concerns uh, over the weekend about whether these firefighters are getting enough quality nutrition to meet the, the intense demands of their job. Now, data from the National Fire Agency highlights some stark differences in meal budgets across fire stations throughout South Korea. Some stations don't even have nutritionists uh, uh, to help plan balanced meals, uh, which only adds to the worries about whether firefighters are being properly supported in their everyday dietary needs. Uh, the fire station in Pegu reported the lowest meal budget at just 3,112 won per meal. Uh, it was followed by this one station in Gyeongsangnam-do province at 3,852 won and one in Cheolabuk-do province at 3,921 now, several other stations in Cholanamdo province, uh, Gangwondo province, Ulsan, and even Seoul reported budgets in the 4,001 range. Now, we've been talking a lot about how food prices have been on the rise. Uh, just everyday restaurants like kimbap restaurants have been closing down by the hundreds in recent months. And to look at these photos of... Um, you know, what should be a really hearty meal. Uh, and it's not oh. that at all, right? It's mm -hmm. just very simple. It's a simple soup, uh, rice. I think I saw like fried a eggs. couple of fried eggs. Yeah. yeah, and just one panchan like kimchi. Mm. It's just not good enough. It's not. I mean, it's one thing if I make that for myself for a quick bite, but if this is Correct. the meal being provided at the workplace for firefighters, I think we're having an entirely different conversation. Yeah. Now, to put this into perspective and make comparisons, these meal budgets are lower than the average price of a convenience store lunchbox, which arguably have been significantly better and hardier. Uh, but that apparently on average cost between 4,000 to 5,000 won. And the meal costs go as low as 3,101 per meal for firefighters. That's right. So um, to give you some further comparison, okay. Uh, the public sector in other areas provides more funding for meals. For example, uh, free school lunches in Seoul have a budget of 5,398 won per meal. And at-risk children in the capital area are allocated 9,000 won Per meal. Now, these figures emphasize just how underfunded these firefighter meal budgets are in comparison. Now, the highest per meal budget uh, for firefighters was found in the Incheon area, where uh, they get around 6,800 won per each meal. But uh, this still only is slightly above the average cost of a basic lunch. Uh, at a convenience store. All right. So the big question is, why is there such a gap and a difference in, in meal budgets at fire stations depending on the locations? Yeah, so the differences in meal budgets uh, come down to the level of financial support provided by each city or provincial government for firefighter uh, meals. For instance, Cholanamdo province doesn't have 
uh, any nutritionists working across its fire stations to uh, ensure proper nutrition. Uh, Cholabukdo Province, Gyeongsangbukdo Province, and Jeju-do Island each only employ one nutritionist. And uh, uh, some of these fire stations, depending on where they are located, uh, they have uh, three meals allocated per day, while others have just two. So that probably, you know, adds to the difference in the budgets. Uh, Yeah. It really does come down to something. I mean, they have a physically demanding job. It could, it would potentially affect their ability to perform their duties effectively and safely. Mm. And you know what, if if my partner uh, in life or a family member or even a close friend, if they were a fire, firefighter and, you know, I found out that this is what they're getting for their meals every day, I'd be very upset. You know what? And I think that's a general consensus. Yes. I mean, that's what the public outcry has been. That's why this is a buzzword this morning. A lot of our listeners are chiming in from different parts of the world. Yes. This is a shocking story. The extraordinary people who risk their lives to save others should be able to eat like kings. And I think yeah. we agree. That's the sentiment. You know, yeah, I mean, these are people mm. who save lives, right? Mm, right. Um, And there has to be a standardized meal program across the country to make sure that consistent support is provided across the board. And it is really vital to ensure that all firefighters have the strength and energy needed to save lives. And not to mention, it's not just about nutrition either. I mean, that's just the basic, right? I mean, just eating a good meal... (laughs) makes your day right yeah and that's the least we can do for someone who you know is in the front lines essentially to save our lives it's the least we can do i mean there's a whole different conversation we can strike up about safe dated safety equipment but first let's start with the meals and work our way into that all right because we're always crunched on time we turn our attention to our second buzzword this morning a lost biblical plant that's right a biblical plant with medicinal properties resurrected (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> from a 1,000 year old seed resurrected. I, I think there's something funny about the use of the yeah. word. <laughs> Is, isn't this incredible though? Yes, it's mind blowing actually. They, they actually managed to grow a plant from a seed that is 1,000 years old. So let's get to the story, okay. shall we? So botanists have grown this long lost tree species from a 1,000 year old seed that was found in a cave in the Judean desert in the 1980s. Uh, The researchers involved in this special project say they believe the tree species could have been the source of a healing bomb uh, that's been mentioned in the Bible and other ancient texts. Uh, The species is thought to be extinct today. All right. It gives you a whole new perspective on the seed yeah. vault, doesn't it? Like, I was yeah. always wondering, for like hundreds and thousands of years from now, can we resurrect and replant these seeds? The simple answer seems yes, according to this yep. example. So can you give us a little bit about a little bit of information about this seed? Where was it discovered? What kind of condition was it in? Which species does it belong to? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so this particular seed uh, was discovered during an archaeological dig in the lower Wadi El Makuk region. Uh, north of Jerusalem. Uh, The ancient seed was found in pristine condition. Uh, But the scientists conducting the research, they weren't able to identify the type of tree from this seed alone. So they had to plant the seed Mm. to find out, right? So (laughs) they planted a seed more than 12 years ago to further uh, investigate. Now, the team's findings have been described in a study that was published on September 10th in the journal Communications Biology. Okay, so here's a complicated question. How does one go about germinating an ancient seed? And what were the changes of that single seed (laughs) actually sprouting? So to germinate this specimen, the researchers used a process that was perfected during a a previous research on a 2,000-year-old date palm seed. And the approach involved soaking the seed in water mixed with hormones and fertilizer before planting it in a pot of sterile soil. So about five and a half weeks after they planted the seed, they actually had a shoot, a tiny shoot. And once it had shed, the team used 
radiocarbon dating on the organic matter to estimate the plant's age and found the specimen dated between 993 and 1202 AD. Now, not long after the tree began to sprout leaves, uh, images of the, of the tree and the leaves were shared with botanists around the world. And the tree is now more than 14 years old and almost three meters tall. It has neither flowered nor born fruit. Now, without these more easily identifiable features, it's not possible to identify the species with certainty. All right, but you said the researchers had a reason to believe that the tree species could have been the source of a healing bomb mentioned in the Bible, so I'm sure they made some connections. Yes, they did. So based on historical research, uh, the scientists initially thought the tree might be the source of what ancient texts from the region, including the Bible, describe as Judean balsam or balm of Gilead, mm. which is a fragrant resin that was harvested to make this uh, coveted perfume that was exported around the world at the time. But this particular tree never gave off any scent. Now, instead, the team detected some healing compounds uh, known for their medicinal use. Uh, the team concluded that the tree may have been the source of a medicinal bomb uh, that is also mentioned in historical texts. Now, uh, one thing I do want to mention that seeds with such an incredible Incredible lifespan, and we're talking about 1,000 years here, are really rare. So if, you know, if they happen to find, you know, any seed that was this old, it, I don't think they would sprout. Not all of them would sprout like this one did. And researchers say they were extremely lucky to have that one chance mm. for that one seed to germinate. All right. Are you floored yet? Because I am. I mean, this is something <laughs> remarkable. Modern science, what else can it do? All and right. like you said, yeah. it's it's really hopeful for, you know, people working at seed banks, right? Exactly. So Because it gives us a lot of hope. If in the in the case of other species going extinct, I mean, we have them in yeah. these seed banks. And if we were to come bring them out again in right conditions, does this mean mm -hmm. civilization could have another chance at it? And it seems that based on this example, yes. Yep. <laughs> All right. I'm glad that we're getting some positive news this morning. Another positive news coming out of Italy. Now, bring your pet to work might be a thing, especially if you're tuning in from, I don't know, Silicon Valley. It's been a thing for a really long time in the private sector. But... What about the Italian Senate? Now, that's a change that no one was expecting. So Italian senators <laughs> might soon be permitted to bring their pets with them to work at Palazzo Madama in Rome. Uh, this initiative was announced on World Animal Day. Uh, Senate leader Ignazio La Russa said, I believe that the time has come to authorize, with due consideration, senators to bring their pets into the Senate. Certainly not in the chamber, <laughs> certainly not in the refreshment area, but in other areas of the Senate. Now, this leader, La Russa, has a German shepherd uh, called Chiara. Now, the idea was first launched uh, by somebody called Michela Vittoria Brambilla, who is the president of the Parliamentary Intergroup for Animal Rights and Environmental Protection, which was established back in 2018. And uh, she was the first to bring her dog, Sonio, uh, which means dream, into parliament buildings back in 2016 to support the proposal to include the protection of animals in the Constitution. And under the proposals, cats and dogs would be permitted in the offices of parliamentarians, uh, not the chamber, and would have a designated <laughs> entrance of their own. Does anybody Dog else think entrance. that's <laughs> so cute? They're going to make a smaller <laughs> door. But yep. as it's expected, because this is a Senate, after all, important decisions get made here. It seems that there are mixed reactions to the very idea of bringing your pet into the Senate chambers. Yeah, you know, a lot of people are really happy about sure. uh, this proposal, but uh, others not quite so, including some politicians. Uh, one person kind of mocked on social media. Finally, the reforms we've been waiting for. Italy is safe. Sarcasm, okay. <laughs> uh, extreme sarcasm right there. Another person wrote, no, I would never bring my dog to the Senate because he would feel uncomfortable in front of some donkeys. As you know, donkeys, 
basically means somebody who is stupid yeah. in Italian. Yeah. Yeah. Better to avoid disappointment. And another person wrote, they should think about not killing animals in the forest instead of proposing these uh, ideas. All right, point taken. Uh, there are more serious matters to get to. We yeah. understand. Uh, thank you so much, Erica, for the coverage. We'll speak to you again tomorrow. Speak to you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.